Chapter 195 Candidate Hidden behind the shadow of an ebony street lamp, a mere twenty meters away from Monsieur Ive, Lumian leaned discreetly, tugging his cap lower amidst the bustling crowd. He watched intently as his mark retrieved the glistening gold coin, secretively stashing it away. Only then did Lumian release a sigh of relief. With one hand nonchalantly tucked inside his pocket, he strolled towards 126th Avenue du Marché, paying no further heed to the dubious decoy, for the luck enhancement spell had been officially set in motion, impervious to interruption. However, the spell required time to manifest its effects. Within half a day, or at most, a full day, misfortune would incessantly plague the false Monsieur Ive. Lumian need only orchestrate a small incident when the opportune moment arrived, and the chances were high that Monsieur Ive would inadvertently unveil his peculiar nature to the legitimate beyonders. As Lumian ventured forth, he soon realized that 126th Avenue du Marché was none other than the abode of Black Scorpion Roger, the very nerve center of the poison sperm mob. Consequently, he dared not approach too closely, wary of exposing himself. Settling himself near a cafe window, diagonally positioned at a distance of over 10 meters, he ordered a formal coffee and a dario. While awaiting his refreshments, Lumian attentively scanned the passerby on Avenue du Marché, his gaze lingering upon the promotional posters adorning the cafe's walls. A prevalent theme among them was the impending national convention elections scheduled to commence on Sunday. There were three contenders vying for the position. Matthew Boulanger, representing the National Party, Hugh Zartoy, championing the Enlightenment Party, and Jack Sanson, hailing from the Revolutionary Party. As Lumion observed the fervor surrounding the approach to 126th Avenue du Marché, he found himself engrossed in the manifestos of the candidates. Matthew Boulanger, the incumbent parliament member for the Lou Marché du Cati du Gentleman District, advocated for the restoration of Intis's former glory. His rallying cry was, Make Intis glorious again. Boulanger attributed the nation's current predicaments to its defeat in the recent war against the Lowen Kingdom. His proposed solution entailed reorganizing the Intis army with a renewed focus on prioritizing Intis's interests. He sought to regain the advantages relinquished in the southern continent, bolster the economy, and transform the marketplace district. Boulanger believed that the process of making Intis glorious again would bestow upon the denizens of the marketplace district an abundance of employment opportunities, enabling them to amass wealth, whether through venturing into the southern continent, enlisting in the army, or capitalizing on foreign trade. Hughes Artoy, a candidate gaining considerable popularity of late, advocated for more jobs, for a fairer society. His pledge was to invigorate the economy, constructing additional factories in the southern region of the marketplace district while simultaneously dismantling the shackles that bound factory owners, bankers, financiers, and merchants. However, his intentions also encompassed challenging the privileges enjoyed by the church and the affluent, imposing heavier taxes upon them. Jacques Sanson, a member of the Revolutionary Party, shared Hugues Artois's conviction that societal privileges had no place in the modern world. Regardless of one's affiliation with the church or financial benefits, Sanson believed that everyone should pay equal taxes. He boldly asserted that the current tariff policies hindered Intis's progress, particularly the city walls and the 54 checkpoints surrounding Treyar. Sanson advocated for the free circulation of goods and the establishment of a liberated market, which would lead to the proliferation of factories and a significant increase in tax revenue. By taxing the privileged class alongside these reforms, the National Treasury would swiftly recover from many initial setbacks. When the time came, Sanson planned to explore the implementation of Emperor Roselle's envisioned annuity guarantee system, providing essential protection to the workers in the marketplace district. His slogan resounded, Take down those damned walls! Having finished reading the candidates' platforms, Lumian couldn't help but feel inclined to vote for Jax Sanson. While it remained uncertain whether Sanson possessed the capability to realize his ideas, cheaper alcohol and goods would bring tangible benefits and security to the people in the marketplace district. As for taxing the privileged, they weren't overly concerned, as long as the burden didn't exceed a copet. Yet, it was evident that Jack Sanson faced discrimination. 
His campaign posters were relegated to the farthest corners, barely visible. This treatment stemmed from the Revolutionary Party's perennial status as a minority within the National Convention. As the poison sperm mob rallied behind Hughes' artoy of the Enlightenment Party, Lumin directed his utmost attention towards this candidate. He not only perused Artois' election platform, but also scrutinized his color photographs. Artois, a man in his thirties, possessed a luxuriant head of black fluffy hair with hints of gray at his temples. His nose stood tall and proud, complemented by deep blue eyes. His height commanded attention, and he exuded an air of refinement when dressed formally. I can't allow this man to be elected, unless I dismantle the poison sperm mop before that happens. However, the mob still enjoys the mysterious support of Madame Moon. Even if one black scorpion falls, another red scorpion will emerge. Yes, the elections are set to commence this Sunday. The police headquarters, military police, and official beyonders will be mobilized to vigilantly monitor each constituency. Causing trouble won't be easy. Should I involve the laborers, porters, and waiters of the Savoy mob? Lumin contemplated how to secure the national convention seat for both Matthew Boulanger and Jacques Sanson. According to Intis law, anyone residing in a constituency for at least six months and having a job or attending university possessed the right to register and vote in that district. Lumian himself had only arrived in Treyar less than a month. Lost in thought, he maintained a watchful eye on the window, hoping to catch sight of Louis Lund. After considerable time had passed, the golden sun ascended into the sky. Lumian realized that waiting was not a viable option. Firstly, his identity posed a problem. He remained under the intense scrutiny of the poison sperm mob, preventing him from waiting in a building opposite Black Scorpion Rogers' residence. Such a vantage point would limit his view and increase the risk of overlooking crucial details. Secondly, as the leader of the Savoy mob, he had numerous responsibilities to fulfill and required moments of respite. Waiting 24 hours a day for two straight days was simply unfeasible. As these thoughts raced through his mind, Lumion was struck by an idea. Why should I do it myself, when I have so many subordinates and even hired Anthony Reed with my own money? With that thought, Lumion rose from his seat and left the cafe, making his way towards Salle de Baubris. As he reached the middle of Avenue du Marché, Lumion's attention was drawn to a gathering by the roadside. At the outskirts of the crowd stood a circle of black uniformed police officers, while two rows of mounted officers observed the passerby. Amidst the 200 to 300 people, there stood a makeshift wooden platform. A man in a black suit, sans bow tie, commanded the stage. A massive poster displaying his photo adorned the outer wall of the house behind him. His resounding voice resonated through the streets. We need jobs. We need better income. I will construct more factories on Rue Saint-Hilaire. I pledge tax concessions for these factories. Ah, isn't that Monsieur Hughes Artois? Lumian, utilizing his above average intus height, could clearly see the speaker on the wooden stage. It was the elegant, black haired, blue eyed Hughes Artois, a candidate supported by the poison sperm mob. Lumian listened for several seconds, his gaze instinctively scanning the upper levels of the building opposite Hughes Artois examining the windows and roof. As expected, he detected signs of police officers or individuals who clearly did not belong to the household. He's well protected indeed. I cannot shoot Hughes Artois in the head or chest from those positions using a rifle. Lumian averted his gaze, a tinge of regret washing over him. There was another way to ensure Hughes Artois' defeat in the election, and that was to prevent him from participating altogether. Those who perished would automatically forfeit their right to run. Lumian had seriously contemplated the feasibility of this plan while at the cafe, but he concluded that it would stir up too much chaos. The market district mobs would likely be mobilized and used as scapegoats. He himself would fall into that category. If that happened, his true identity would likely be exposed, compelling him to flee the market district, if not Treyar, altogether. He would lose the opportunity to track down Madame Police and the Padre. Assassinating the candidate appeared to be quite a challenge. Even if he were fortunate enough to succeed, escape might not be guaranteed. Lumian shifted his gaze to the people standing behind the wooden platform. 
They were most likely members of Hugh's Our Choice campaign, a trio of men and two women. Among them, there was a woman with fiery red hair, rumored to possess noble lineage. Her features were striking, with chiseled lines on her face, yet there was an overall air of neutrality to her beauty. Tall and attired in a white and brown hunting suit, she was accompanied by four other individuals. Fearful of missing Louis Lund, Lumion paid no heed to Hugh's Artois oration. He withdrew from the throng and made his way back to Sao de Balbriz. Noontime brought few patrons to the establishment. Some waiters and bartenders took a break, while others busied themselves with tidying up. Addressing Louis and Sarkota, Lumion spoke up. Dispatched four men to keep watch at 126 Avenue du Marché. 126? Louis repeated, his voice filled with astonishment. Isn't that Black Scorpion Rogers' residence? Is the boss planning to stir up trouble for the poison sperm mob once again? Lumion nodded, his expression candid. You've got it. Don't get too close and ensure you remain undetected. Stand guard from different vantage points and observe whether he appears among the passerby. Lumion gestured toward the wanted posters adorning the wall, as well as Louis Lund, who stood nearby. Since joining the Savoy mob, Lumian's own wanted poster had been discreetly moved to an even more inconspicuous spot. Louis and Sarkota turned their attention to the wanted poster, carefully examining its contents. Words like Cordu Village caught their eye. They grasped the general idea and readily agreed. Yes, boss. Once the four mobsters departed Sao de Balbris with the wanted poster in tow, Lumian turned to Louis and Sarkota. For the next few days, your task will be to maintain order on the first floor dance hall. Having issued his instructions, Lumion added nonchalantly, I just caught snippets of Hugh's Artois' speech. Not bad. Hmm. Whom does our Savoy mob support as the market district's member of parliament? Louis cast a quick glance around and lowered his voice. The Baron mentioned that he intends to vote for Monsieur Artois. 